to some news emerging today from the Prime Minister's visit to China. John Key's visit has been very much focused on trade. An improved free trade agreement between the two countries is being negotiated. But the Chinese Premier, Li Keqiang, has also asked for a formal extradition treaty with China, seeking the return of 30 to 60 people living in New Zealand wanted for alleged fraud and embezzlement. It's something China's been pushing for some time. In 2013, the president of the National Party, Peter Goodfellow, met with Central Commission for Discipline Inspection in China, CCDI, which is China's anti-corruption campaign leader. At the time, Mr Goodfellow told Nine to Noon he'd made general expressions of goodwill but refused to say whether he had made any offers of assistance to uh, the requests that may have been coming from China in respect to individuals living in New Zealand. We also asked government agencies, including the police, whether they'd been approached by China with respect to one particular individual believed to be living in Auckland. John Key now says he's not opposed to having a formal treaty arrangement as long as it is for serious cases and that people would not face torture or the death penalty upon their return to China. Earlier this year, the Law Commission released a report which would see a shake-up of extradition laws. Waikato University Professor of Law Neil Boyster is an expert on extradition treaties. He says foreign fugitive numbers are on the rise. Neil, good morning. Morning, Catherine. The reporting that was done actually by our Asia correspondent Jamil Andalini at the time, he was based in Beijing, was very much about the interest of authorities then. It was reported to uh, Chinese citizens living in New Zealand and Australia. As we said, we had a difficult time getting firm, clear responses about any um, communications uh, or, or requests that might have gone to New Zealand. Uh, Mr Goodfellow certainly said in his trip this was very much in the context of conversations and goodwill and uh, etc. had to be regarded in that context. Uh, but what became clear was that China had an interest in people living in New Zealand. What do you make of this next step, which is discussions about a formal extradition treaty? Well, it's, it's the logical step, I suppose. They have made extradition requests to, in the past. They've currently got an extradition request in for a Korean national who's resident in New Zealand on an allegation of murder in Shanghai. Um, that, if that uh, request was uh, granted by the Justice Minister Amy Adams and is now under judicial review, um, but it's done on the legislation, our legislation, so the, uh, our current legislation allows New Zealand to extradite uh, simply on the basis of the domestic law and doesn't require a treaty, but it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Obviously, China would prefer it to be a, a more formal arrangement to go to a bilateral treaty in which uh, New Zealand and China promise to provide extradition in respect of a limited range of offences or a serious, uh, serious offences measured on a penalty and in prison. And uh, so they want to really formalise that relationship. They've, there's an extradition treaty with Hong Kong and there's, there isn't one with China. And um, I suppose this is the logical step. It is logical, isn't it, when so many relations, uh, aspects to relations with China are normalised, including that free trade uh, deal that was done and uh, including what are very now very strong trade and person-to-person -person links. You might say New Zealand has extradition treaties with other countries. Why would it not have with China? Could you explain our situation, our agreements with other countries? Are there other countries where human rights issues or justice system issues have precluded us signing a deal? Well, I think we've in fact got quite limited uh, bilateral extradition treaty relations that we um, as an independent country have, have um, uh, set up ourselves. I think there are only four. I can't remember all the countries involved, South Korea, Hong Kong. We inherited a, a, a lot of uh, extradition, and the United States, of course, in the dot-com case. But we inherited a lot of extradition treaties uh, from uh, the uh, from Britain because they were party, and we simply inherited the, the treaty obligations. We have an extradition relationship of a loose kind with all the members of the Commonwealth, and they will in that will include countries um, with uh, extremely dubious human rights records. So it's n it's not as though we won't entertain extradition requests from countries with with uh, with questionable human rights records, particularly in the criminal justice system. But uh, formalizing a bilateral treaty with China would be, I think, a, 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 you know, something quite novel for New Zealand to set about on its own. The context here is a long-running 
crackdown on corruption in China. This was the context for the 2013 mm. stories that we did. Uh, just reading here, the, the BBC reporting that its crackdown netted 300,000 in 2015. Some uh, 200, they punished nearly 300,000 officials last year for corruption. It's not explicit how many of those were uh, were in China and how many it may or may, su may successfully or otherwise have been able to bring back from abroad. So this is this is the context in which this request is coming in. You mentioned a current case. Could you please a current request under our existing arrangements? Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, no, they 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 have a re well, they've made a request some time ago for a um. And in fact, the person subject to the request has been in custody for four years, which is an incredibly long time. Uh, they made a request which was granted by the minister. So it's been through the extradition uh, court, which has uh, has confirmed that the person is extraditable. Uh, the Justice Minister has granted the request, but in the nature of these things, the very last line of defence, if you like, is judicial review of the Minister's request on a, oh, the usual uh, conditions, which are, is it reasonable under the circumstances, so it's to be tested against its reasonableness and the, and the particular power set out uh, in respect so of the Minister. So that person is in prison in New Zealand? Yes, in Wellington. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's look at what would change to that, what then sounds like quite a thorough process involving New Zealand law and New Zealand practices, mm. what would change under an extradition treaty? Would there be the same ability for New Zealand courts to probe and request information mm. uh, and, and give guidance? Would there be the same process or would, what would be the process? Um, well, it would be, in effect, still governed by the Extradition Act 1999. Whether there was a formalised treaty relationship or whether it was on an ad hoc basis, based on legislation, it would still be governed by the Extradition Act, and that involves effectively a, the classic two-stage inquiry, the inquiry by the court to decide whether the individual is extraditable, and that is really to, to, uh, to test whether we uh, criminalise the same kind of behaviour and whether there is sufficient evidence uh, uh, alleged against this individual um, for... Uh, uh, in this particular case to meet our standards. Um, it's not the kind of evidence that would convict you in a criminal court because it's only a prima facie case, and uh, so it's a much, it's a much um, lower standard of evidence. The, the uh, second stage is the minister's decision. So it's the minister who decides under the current legislation whether someone is going to be extradited, and the minister has to take into account the possible treatment of the, um, the individual, but the... the the various mandatory uh, um, bars to extradition, which are the political offence exception and the military offence exception, etc., those bars are really don't prevent the extradition of someone for a standard serious offence like fraud or uh, murder, where the real problem is actually going to be the quality of their treatment in prison. So even the death penalty exception, which is a, which is a standard exception, um, is 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 uh, can be circumvented by the country in question, the requesting country making uh, assurances, as uh, as China has done in this, the case of this Korean. It has assured New Zealand that it will not seek the death penalty, even though he's going to be charged with murder in China. This is what John Key has said. Uh, I said in print about a formal treaty arrangement. I said in principle, if they wanted to put up a case about an individual, they met the criteria, they were prepared to honour our conditions, then we certainly wouldn't say no. Uh, quoting again about the um, uh, the, the, the uh, people being sent back to China and held to account if they were found to have quote ripped off the state. This is the journalist uh, or his words, I think. Mr. Mm -hmm. Key said, I think it's possible. We're certainly not opposed. Clearly, people would need to meet the conditions. Uh, New Zealand would not allow extradition unless the government was certain that people would not be tortured or face the death penalty. So again, how can those conditions be part of any formal treaty? And tell me a bit more about what the Law Commission review is doing and how it might inform any formal treaty. Yeah, I, I personally don't think the death penalty is the, the, the real problem because the Chinese government is always, if requested, going to give assurances that the death penalty will neither be sought nor applied. And if it were to be applied in a particular case after an assurance had been given that it wouldn't be applied, I think that that would be the end of the extradition relationship, at least 
for the foreseeable future because there's in because they would have been acting in bad faith they're not going to do that the real issue here is the is the quality of imprisonment in china the length of 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 time that the person is likely to spend in prison but also how they are likely to be treated in prison and there are lots of reports about the poor treatment of prisoners in china and so if mr key is prepared to go and entertain such um uh um uh, a, a treaty making process with the china chinese government he and the new zealand government are going to have to be satisfied that with the quality of treatment that the chinese government is likely to deal out to its prisoners is there uh, is there a threshold of evidence before extradition kicks and i'm just looking generally the number of requests for extradition to new zealand over the last 4 years is about 70 i think this is this yeah. is precluding whatever's going on with requests from china uh, in the absence of an extradition treaty, but is there any threshold of evidence that's required, or if someone yes, someone simply is. W- w- what is that threshold? Well, it's still, as I said, a prima facie case. In effect, it would be enough to um, uh, enough evidence to convict in the absence of any countervailing evidence from the defence. But the defence doesn't have the right to bring evidence. Uh, so, because the extradition hearing is not a criminal trial, all that the the, um, the the requesting state is doing is putting up enough evidence to satisfy the extradition court judge, which is a district court judge, um, to that there is a sufficient case, a sufficiently strong case against the the uh, particular individual and to of, justify and of, their and, and of a serious enough offence? Is there a threshold yeah, well, to the offence? Yeah, I mean, well, someone yeah. speaking out against Chinese leadership here in New Zealand, are they going to uh, you know, potentially face, face an issue, or does there have to be a threshold of seriousness? No, I think if they... It, it, the, your example about the speaking out against the Chinese leadership, that would immediately fall under the political offence exception, and right. so the minister would be... Um, justified in not granting ex- extradition if it was a political offence or an offence, as they say, of a political character, which is slightly broader. But the the threshold of seriousness of the offences is usually a year in prison or more. So it, an offence that, um, uh, that carried that penalty here in New Zealand uh, would be considered, or more, would be considered uh, extraditable. The alternative approach is to enumerate the, the offences, which is our relationship with the United States, the, the the 1970 extradition treaty lists the offences and so if we entered a bilateral treaty with China we could either list the serious offences or we could put a penalty threshold as the criteria. You made, of you, made, you made the comment earlier that it would be I think remarkable or a similar word for New Zealand to go into a formal treaty to take the step to a formal treaty quote on our own. What, what are you saying there? I suppose would, would, would we be leading the way with it as we were with the free trade deal? Would we be the first to do it or, or, or the first no, I don't similar know. country to do it? Or? No, no. I think we would be. Um, we've been very careful about our extradition relations at a bilateral level uh, since um, uh, becoming effectively independent of the, of the crown, of the British uh, extradition relation. So the British have set up a whole lot of extradition relations which we inherited, but as I said, on, on, on New Zealand's own, it's only really set up four independent relations. And of course, it's, it, it has signed large multilateral treaties like the Organised Crime Convention, which do provide for extradition, but hardly ever used. Uh, so it would be quite a step um, for New Zealand. This is, it, it, it doesn't have bilateral relations with a whole range of its, of its uh, close uh, partners. And here it would be setting up one with China. Now, China has been criticised for poor imprisonment conditions. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for your time. Waikato University Professor of Law, Neil Boyster.